it occurred to me that the techniques that I was using with large government agencies, uh, if I can make them accessible to the average everyday decision maker, that would be a useful addition to Omar's workshops. I approached him with the idea, he loved the idea, and we decided to write a book together on how to do that. And the book was called The Focused Decision Maker. And the, um, what we're going to talk about today uh, are the techniques we put into the book. Now, uh, basically, if I ask the question, I know I can't see you raise your hands, but if I say, how many out there just love making hard, challenging decisions, or how many people hate it, I'm guessing that many of you fall in the latter category. Uh, how many of you will do virtually everything possible to delay thinking about facing a really hard decision? I know in my house, it's amazing what gets accomplished when my wife faces a really hard decision. Basically, closets get cleaned out, the pantry gets reorganized, every conceivable load of laundry gets done, anything to avoid having to make that hard decision. Let's face it, most people really hate making decisions. Most people aren't very good at making decisions. And most people can use some guidance in making these really challenging, tough decisions. And that's what this focused decision-making approach is all about. Now, over the years, Greg and I have helped a lot of people make decisions. Uh, I know I've come across two very different attitudes toward decision-making in general. The first one is captured in this quote from Napoleon. Nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than to be able to decide. It's a pretty noble thought. The second uh, approach is reflected in a quote from that great management guru, Dogbert. Nothing good ever came from a management decision. Avoid making man management decisions whenever possible. They can only get you in trouble. Now, if you prescribe to Dogbert's philosophy, I probably can't help you very much. But if you believe as Napoleon did, then the focused decision-making approach could be pretty useful to you. Whether you're the CEO of a major firm, an owner or manager of a small business, a, a sole proprietor, or even just someone who's focused on ma making personal family decisions, the ideas and the hints of focused decision making are relevant and should be helpful. If you're a small business person, you have to make decisions regarding contracts, vendors, proposals, and general operations of the firm. If you're in the financial services industry, such as a realtor, an insurance agent, or a financial planner, you have to understand how your clients make their decisions if you really want to help them. If you run a franchise, such as a restaurant, a fitness center, well, you have to make personnel decisions, equipment decisions, <clears throat> and financial decisions. If you're a parent, you have to make decisions about school choices, family finances, home and car purchases, and so forth. As an investor, you have to make decisions regarding when and what to buy and sell, and how to manage cash flow and tax implications. Let's face it. Decision-making is at the heart of virtually everything we do, whether we're in government, whether we're in the private sector, or whether we're just focused on our family's welfare. In all cases, we have to deal with three things, preferences, alternatives, and information. So we might ask ourselves, why is it then that we have such a hard time making decisions? We can identify four reasons why decision-making is difficult. First, the cost of making a bad decision might be professionally, monetarily, and personally very high. Life savings may be involved in a business decision, and even lives themselves may hang in the balance of types of decisions. Seven years ago, when my oldest daughter was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, she was faced with treatment decisions that had very nasty potential consequences, including death. Spoiler alert, great decisions were made by her and her doctors, the disease was eliminated thanks to a bone marrow transplant from a generous stranger. She's healthy, and she and her husband have just celebrated their seventh wedding anniversary. But as you can imagine, thinking about the stakes and possible consequences each step of the way was really stressful. But the doctors are the ones who can talk with expertise about possible outcomes and their probabilities, but only the patient can know how he or she feels about the potential outcomes. Additionally, we don't all feel the same which means that decisions are personal, and what is considered to be a really good result for one person may be viewed as a bad result for another person. Now, in many decisions, 
more than one person may have a stake in that decision, and their respective goals and values may conflict with each other. One partner in a small business may want to grow very rapidly. Another want to grow slowly and conservatively. Uh, it doesn't mean that one person is correct and the other is wrong, since they have conflicting objectives, but conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. In many cases, openly expressed conflict can be healthy for a business or a personal decision. But very often, we don't agree. Our conflicts, uh, our objectives are in conflict with each other. Number three, we have to recognize uh, that when we make a decision in the present, we are uncertain about how events will unfold in the future. We don't have the luxury of knowing what will happen with certainty. And dealing with uncertainty is very, very difficult. For example, if we're thinking about investing in a rental property, which I was uh, recently looking at, to generate some additional income, the results will depend on what percent of the time we can keep the property rented, the care that tenants will take of the property, and the hidden surprises that often show up when we least expect them, such as mold uh, hidden behind the walls, the impact of hurricanes. We recently went through uh, Hurricane Irma down here in Florida, destruction from earthquakes, and so forth. If only we knew for sure what was going to happen, making decisions would be easy. Unfortunately, we don't. We have to figure out how to make good decisions, knowing that the future is uncertain, and much of it is outside our control. Flipping a coin to deal with uncertainty just doesn't cut it. And we will need approaches to deal with what we will refer to as probability. Finally, we also have to recognize and learn to work with people who have different attitudes towards decision making. Some people are meticulous planners who never make a decision without employing a thought process that is logical, methodical, and quantitative. That pretty much describes me. Others like to fly by the seat of their pants and follow their instincts when making a decision. Neither process is inherently right or wrong. Decision making is a very important and very personal matter and is impacted by an incredible number of factors that affect the process. Those impacts may vary as widely as the number of people making the decisions. Working with people holding different attitudes is inevitable. It can be challenging, it can be frustrating, but it can also be rewarding. Yes, decision making can be difficult and stressful. And that's exactly why we developed the focused decision making approach. So now let me tell you a little bit more about the approach itself. No, focus is not misspelled. It's an acronym. First, we have to frame the problem. You have to make sure you're addressing the right problem and that you understand the scope of the decision. Objectives. You have to know and understand the objectives and the values that you're trying to accomplish. You have to develop creative, meaningful alternatives and choices to address the decision. Consequences. We have to identify the possible outcomes, both good and bad, that may happen after you make your decision. Uncertainty. Okay. Uh, most people judge whether or not they made a good decision by what happens as a result of that decision. The problem is, we have to make the decision before we know what was going to happen. So that's not a fair way to judge. And there's a big difference between a good decision and a good outcome. Outcome is one that feels good. What, happened, uh, what did happen is what we wanted to happen, and we're happy about it. On the other hand, a good decision is one where the choice is consistent with those three pillars that we talked about. Um, it's consistent with the preferences that we're trying to achieve, the alternatives that we face, and the information that we know and don't know about the decision situation. And we believe that in the long run, helping you to make more good decisions leads to more good outcomes. That said, the best of us don't get it. So let's quickly go through the steps in the process. And to make things easy, what I did in the book and what I'll do in this uh, demonstration is take the case of uh, Mike and Maddie Rose. Mike is unhappy with his current job. He's seriously thinking of quitting and buying a franchising opportunity. And what we'll do is we'll follow Mike and, uh, through this focused decision-making process. It's usually best to use an example, so that's what we'll do. The first step in the focused decision process is to frame the problem or uh, the decision properly. And what does that mean? It means making sure you've defined the problem, you've identified the constraints that limit your choices, you've identified the stakeholders, the laid out assumptions that are making your analysis, and basically you're setting the stage for making a quality decision. Jim Adams, in his book Conceptual Blockbusting, describes a problem that agriculture industry had many, many years ago. 
they, uh, there was a mechanical tomato picker that was being used, and it was damaging a high percentage of the tomato crop. And this was having a pretty serious impact on profits. And the industry spent millions of dollars trying to solve the problem, which can be paraphrased as, how can we develop a better mechanical tomato picker that will minimize damage to the crops? They did a lot of work, they spent a lot of time and a lot of money, and they eventually solved the problem by developing a in tomato. Had they, initially, uh, had they initially framed the problem as how can we keep from damaging the tomatoes during the picking process, rather than how can we develop a better mechanical tomato picker, a new range of alternatives would have become available, and uh, perhaps much sooner, and saving time and many, many dollars. I really like that example as what happens when you frame the problem improperly. Well, the real key to this step is making sure you're solving the right problem. And there are a lot of tools that we describe in the course and in the book, and um, one of the ones I'm going to show you is what we call the Stakeholder Issue Identification Matrix. Okay, now in the, um, what we do here is we take this simple tool to lay out all the key issues that we're facing in the decision. Sometimes they're economic, sometimes they're legal, sometimes they may even be emotional. The rows represent the types of issues, the columns represent the key stakeholders in the decision, and for the sample problem, these stakeholders are Mike, his wife Maddie, the franchiser, and the bank. So you can see, from his point of view, he's worried about net income, competition, uh, what management role he's going to play, uh, the bank is worried about its finances, what the economy is going to look like, the type of corporation. By using a tool like the stakeholders matrix, we can identify the things that truly are our preferences and uh, the things that are truly uh, what we value. The next step in the focus process is dealing with objectives. When you really get down to it, Decision-making is all about achieving the objectives that reflect our values and our preferences. And it's important that we recognize that there's no such thing as a right decision that applies to everyone, or at least I've never come across one. When it comes to making a good decision, one size does not fit all. Now, many people, when they face a difficult decision, they start by identifying a set of alternatives that they will consider and then figuring out what criteria they will use to decide among the alternatives. That's what we call alternatives-focused thinking. It's very common, but it's the reverse of how we should be making decisions. Ralph Keeney is credited with developing a different and better approach known as value-focused thinking, or VFT. In VFT, we start with the objectives and the values that we're trying to satisfy before we identify the alternatives. And by doing this, we're in a better position to be proactive in shaping our decision opportunities to maximize the potential value for those with a stake in the decision. Once we've identified the objectives and the values, we use those to develop more creative alternatives and later to evaluate and improve those alternatives or even to develop new ones sometimes. So uh, the way we do this, uh, one of the things we can use is a, uh, a value hierarchy. And it's simply a framework, an outline, a tree type of structure for representing our objectives. So if we go back to Mike and Maddie, their value hierarchy might look something like this. In trying to decide about what franchise to pick and which particular uh, franchise opportunity, they have three major what we call fundamental objectives. They answer the question of why are you doing something. <coughs> Excuse me. There are three major objectives were to maximize long-term wealth from the franchise ownership, maximize the enjoyment of the experience, and provide an economically viable business opportunity. And you can see each of those is broken down a little bit further. So maximizing long-term wealth, that's the track record of success and opportunities for growth. Uh, enjoyment of the franchise, they want to have fun owning and operating it, but they also want to have enough time to spend with the family without sacrificing performance. So a very simple outline, uh, we call it a hierarchy, and we can use that to lay out what our values and preferences truly are. Okay, so so far, we've talked about making sure we're solving the right problem and about our objectives, which represent the things that we value. The next step in the process is to develop the choices that are available to us whether they're called choices, options, alternatives, courses of action, doesn't matter. They're the elements of a decision over which we have control. We get to define the set of choices that we want to evaluate in a way that best meet our objectives and our values. Now, it's hard to make a great decision if all our choices are allowed. Yeah, we can select the best of the bad, but if we really want to make a good decision, 
we need to develop a good set of alternatives. Our goal should be to develop a set of alternatives that's feasible, complete, compelling, and diverse. By feasible, we mean that the choice must not be impossible to pursue. It could be really hard. It could be very tough, but not impossible. By being complete, we mean that we need to ensure that we have carefully defined what the choice includes and excludes. Full, clear definitions and descriptions are absolutely the most important part of any decision process. By being compelling, we mean that each choice that we are seriously considering has something that strongly favors it and makes it appealing. There's no point in having just throw away choices just for the sake of having more choices. By being diverse, we mean that the choices should have some significant differences from each other and not just vary by tiny increments. That said, it's almost always good practice to include a, quote, do-nothing alternative, since that is almost always a viable choice. It's a good practice also to include some sort of hypothetical ideal alternative, which has all the features that would lead to the highest value on all your value measures. By including an ideal alternative, when we conclude our evaluation, we can see where our best choice falls short of what we would really like. Now, in generating our choices, we typically go through a two-stage process. First, we have a divergent stage in which we let the creative juices flow. We try to generate many diverse ideas. We don't judge them as to whether they're good or bad. And wild and crazy ideas not only are accepted, but they're encouraged. We use our vision statement, our issues list, our objectives hierarchy to spark innovative thought. And once we have a rich set of possibilities, we move into a convergent stage where we try to pare down the set of choices to a small number of well-designed alternatives for evaluation. The first stage involves a lot of individual or even group creativity, whereas the second stage benefits from highly organized, logical thinking. The strategy table is a great tool for developing a solid set of choices. And I'll demonstrate what the strategy table is and uh, with a very, very simple, familiar concept. Uh, I'm going to a Chinese restaurant. We want to figure out what meal to order. The decision for a meal consists of several components of the decision, a choice on a soup, a choice on an appetizer, an entree, a dessert, and a beverage. And you can see there's a column in this chart for each one of those decision components. And for each component, you see there are alternate choices there. Soups, none, wonton, egg drop, hot and sour, and so forth. Now notice you don't have the same number of items in every column. This is not a matrix. It's just a connected set of columns. Now, depending on our mood and the occasion, we might select different choices. If it's near the end of the month and the budget's tight, the theme for the meal may be low budget. If we've been trying to lose a few pounds, the theme may be low calorie. If it's just an ordinary night out, the theme may be regular dinner. Or if it's our anniversary and we feel like splurging, the theme may be special occasion. So we can expand the strategy table to reflect our themes and to indicate what we would choose for each theme. There's the themes. So for example, for the low budget theme, I might have no soup, no appetizer, chicken lo mein, fortune cookies, and soda. And I could do the same thing for each of those four different strategies or themes. And uh, I will do that in the next slide with a different uh, shaped symbol for each of the different options, each of the different strategies. So for example, that special occasion, followed the square, we had the hot and sour soup, lobster rolls, Peking duck, fried ice cream, and champagne. The strategy table, what it does, and notice I can have the same choice in more than one theme, but what the strategy table does for us, it allows us to take what were originally hundreds of possible combinations and pare the choices down to a manageable set of four in this case. So the obvious question is, could a tool like this be useful for other more serious types of problems? Absolutely. You just need to identify the components of the decision, the choices that you have available, and the different themes, just like in the restaurant menu. So the strategy table for Mike and Maddie on their uh, franchise might look something like this. And these are just a few of the elements. Uh, as you can see, the three dots show this goes on and on. The nature of the franchise, it could be existing or it could be new. The size of the chain, it could be a small less than 10 location, hundreds of locations, or 1,000 locations. The size of the facility, small, medium, large, or a mega complex, and so forth. But basically, they've taken the components of the decision, laid out the alternatives, and uh, of course, in a real, the real problem, you need more than just those five components, but this is a logical way to lay out the choices that you're going to do. And so following the example of the restaurant, we can identify themes across the factors just as we did in the restaurant example. So we've come up with four different strategy themes here, 
and we've defined uh, each of the characteristics. We picked one of the alternatives that we had there. So, for example, for a very crawl, walk, run type of strategy, he would go with a new uh, franchise, Reading Across, uh, one that's got less than 10 locations, small facility, basic exercise, and no non-exercise types of things. On the other hand, we could go for something like he calls go for the gold, which could either be an existing or a new facility. He's going to go with a franchise that's got many, many locations, over 1,000 locations like LA Fitness. It's a mega facility with a lot more than the basic exercise offerings. It's got a juice bar, a snack bar, a restaurant, and so forth. But the same concept as the restaurant. We just have to lay out the choices. And now once we understand uh, what the choices are, we have to start figuring about uh, how to measure the consequences. Uh, now, what we need to do here uh, is define a few basic terms before we get a little further. So uh, let's say we're going to take a little example here. I'm going to flip a coin. If you call it correctly, you win $10. If you call it incorrectly, you win nothing. And we know there's uncertainty whether the flip will be heads or tails. We refer to the outcomes or the possible things that may occur for the coin, heads or tails. We're going to ignore the fact that it could land on its side. We then define the consequences. What happens if an outcome occurs? The consequence of calling the coin correctly was, I win $10. The consequence of calling it incorrectly is to win nothing. But consequences aren't enough. We have to talk about the value of the consequence. This is a very personal issue and highly dependent upon context. Values express our uh, preferences. To a college student, in a coin flip example, winning $10 may mean different things to different people. To the college student living on Raymond noodles, $10 may have a great value. To Donald Trump, we know he's rich. He's told us that $10 is almost meaningless. Clearly, value is a personal issue, and it's highly dependent on the context of the decision. And recall that one of the three pillars of focused decision-making was preferences. We use values to express these preferences. And finally, the way we can uh, put this all together, we can use a consequence table, which is a summary of the characteristics that describe the levels of performance for all of the objectives. So let's take a look at what the uh, specific franchises for Mike and Maddie would look like in a consequence table. So he's now come up with uh, four basic specific fitness franchises he wants to evaluate. For your health, fit to be tied, better bodies gym, and fitness focus. And we can see, we can compare each of these on several characteristics. The average same chain annual return on investment, for example. The frank, uh, fran franchise 500 ranking. The average same chain turnover rate for employees. Financial requirements, uh, and so forth and so on. So this is just a description. Uh, each uh, of the options, we know the characteristic. Uh, this hasn't told us how to evaluate it yet, but so far we know uh, a little bit more about each of the alternatives. So the next step is now actually how do we measure value. This is the, what we call a score, and with the preferences, how we value them, uh, we're going to call the values. Now, measuring value, we can do it in a lot of different ways. The two most common are to use a relative approach, in which we directly compare things, or we can use an absolute approach, in which we define a specific measurement scale that can be used to get a consistent measure from one consequence to another. So for example, if I have a bunch of people in the room, I can use a relative approach to visually order them from tallest to shortest to see uh, who's the tallest in the room, if tallness is a measure of uh, objectivity. Uh, or I can take a, uh, a ruler, uh, a tape measure, and get an exact measure for height and in inches. The relative approach typically is quicker but less accurate. The absolute approach takes longer, but it's usually far more accurate. Now remember that making decisions, we need to evaluate our choices in terms of our objectives, and that's where values come into play. We need some sort of scale, either relative or absolute, to compare the choices on each objective. Now, we can take an easy approach and uh, convert the consequence table uh, and just do a ranking table by replacing the performance characteristic with the rank, best to worst or first to last. While the ranking approach does give us some insight into how choices compare on a relative basis, it really doesn't help us much in answering overall which is best and by how much. Can we do better than ranking? Sure. We can move to an approach called scaling. Simply put, we define scales that can be used for direct measurement. Some things such as height, cost, storage, fuel economy, 
have very natural measures like inches and dollars and gigabytes and miles per gallon. We can measure those directly. Whenever we can, we try to use these natural scales. However, some things don't have natural measures, such as the quality of a dive in Olympic diving competitions. In these cases, we develop what are known as constructed scales. The Olympic judges have a well-defined scale that runs from 1 to 10, with a clear but somewhat subjective definition of what a diver must do to get a particular number on the scale. For every word score, uh, we also use word scores and star scores, like a power rate, JD Power rating, or um, a Yelp, uh, things like that use uh, typically star scores. But we assume that there's some sort of definition of what it takes to get that score. There are a lot of different types of scales we can make. We can construct word scales for measurement. Uh, measurements can run from low to high to mi um, to very high. We can assign numbers to these words. Uh, we can use stars like JD Power or TripAdvisor. And for every word or star score, we have to assume that there is a good definition of what it takes to get that score. Unfortunately, that still doesn't give us a good way to combine across characteristics using sound math. We can visually kind of look and see where the high scores and the low scores are, but we don't have a good way to combine them yet. We can solve that problem by associating a numeric scale with each of these types of scales. And it helps to distinguish how a choice performs, which we call the score, and the number that reflects our preference for that level of performance, which we call the value. For simplicity today, we're just going to use a simple 0 to 100 scale. It's called an interval scale. 0 just means it's defined as the bottom of the scale. It doesn't mean you get no value. 100 is defined as the top of the scale. And it doesn't mean you've got everything that you want. Um, in the course, we talk about other approaches as well. But for the word scoring scale, it might look like the scale shown uh, in the picture below. Sometimes uh, people are visual. They like graphs better. Uh, they can use the horizontal axis of a graph to represent the score, the vertical axis to represent the value. Uh, I've used color-coded scales. And one time I did, I got in trouble because I didn't realize it, but the decision maker was colorblind. So you have to be really careful when you're using these types of scales. You have to really know your decision makers. Now let's go back to Mike and Maddie. We've created some scales for several of their uh, objectives and uh, value measures. So for example, on the average same chain annual return on investment, let's see, I think I have a pointer here. Um, we have different bounds on the scale. If it's less than 20% average same chain annual return, we give it a zero. If it's greater than 75%, we give it a 100. And we can create some intermediate points and we create the scale. It does not have to be a straight line type of scale. It can have any shape to it. Uh, you can see we've done something similar for miles to the nearest same chain competitor. Less than three miles, you get a zero. Greater than 10, you get a 100. Uh, three to five, a 33, 67. So we create a scale like this for every one of the characteristics that we're going to use to compare our alternatives. So now, with these scales, we can convert the characteristics to numbers that represent value, and then the numbers are easier to compare. So we took the characteristics, we ran them through these value scales, we get numbers here that are on a 0 to 100 scale. So for example, for your health, scored an 80 on this characteristic, a 0 on franchise ranking, a 100 on nearest, uh, miles to nearest competitor, and if we go across all the characteristics, and there are more than just these five, when I did it in the actual example and ra uh, ran it across and aggregated, I came up with 1,012 points for For Your Health, 1247 for Fit to be Tied, 1257 for Better Bodies Gym, and 1358 for Fitness Focus. Now, does that mean we're ready to make a decision? Can we pick the alternative with the highest score? We can do that, right? Well, yeah, we can. That's what many decision makers do. But we're focused decision makers, and we can do better. At this stage of the game, if all we do is add things up, we're treating every value measure as being equally important. That's rarely the case. Let's face it, in life, some things are just more important than others. And a focused decision maker will include that concept in making his or her decision. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, but before we do, it's time to talk about the next step in the focus process, dealing with uncertainty. This quote may be humorous, but the reality is that we are terrible at dealing with uncertainty. Most people 
When they have to talk in terms of probabilities, they just don't get it. And there's a reason for that. Dealing with probabilities is very, very difficult, even for those of us who deal with them every day in our work. If you were to implement the concepts of focused decision-making that we've talked about up to here and avoid a lot of detail about uncertainty, you'd still be better decision-makers, but uh, adding probability takes you one step further. Unfortunately, in today's presentation, we just don't have time to cover how to deal with uncertainty in detail, but I want you to recognize that it's very important to incorporate uncertainty and probability into your thinking and decision-making. And there are very simple tools such as decision trees and influence diagrams for dealing with uncertainty, but for now, I'm going to show you a very, very simple way to think about probabilities. Uh, Sherman Kent, a few years ago, uh, he worked at the CIA, and he was looking at ways that intelligence analysts evaluated reports. And he believed that there was a common language that everybody used. So when someone used a phrase like highly likely, all the analysts would have a, a roughly similar interpretation. And he did an experiment to test this, and he found that analysts were just all over the board on the interpretation of probabilistic phrases. Uh, probabilities range from 10 to 80 for the same probabilistic phrase. So he developed what is known as the Sherman-Kent scale, so we can use a common language in discussing uncertain events. You can use either of the first two rows to describe an event, and the third row gives you a range of probabilities. So if you use the words almost no chance or remote, we're talking about something with a 1% to 5% probability of happening. If you use the words unlikely or improbable, 20 to 45%. Almost certain or nearly certain, you're talking about 95 to 99%. And this is a really difficult area to deal with. Uh, if you've ever served on a jury for a serious case and the judge says to you, reasonable doubt, well, what the heck does that mean? What kind of probability are they talking about? And it's never defined. So uh, you can use either of the first two rows for your verbal description, but a scale like this at least gives you an easy way to be thinking about probabilities. So let's go on to the next step. Swaps. Let's get back to the notion that some things are more important than others. We usually can't get everything we want. We typically have to give up one thing to get another. And in most of the important decisions we make, there are multiple conflicting objectives. If I want a car with better gas mileage, I may have to give up some performance. If we want more house for our dollar, we may have to move further away from where we really like to be. If we want more return on our investment portfolio, we may have to take more risk. So we typically swap satisfaction of one objective for another by making trades. Sometimes this is easy. Sometimes it's very challenging. And until now, we've kind of ignored this critical concept. Now we're going to learn how to take some simple tools for prioritizing your goals and objectives and making these relevant trades. We can easily solve the problem of trading off across our objectives by assigning numerical weights to the objectives and the value measures to reflect their relative importance. Uh, this is one of the most commonly used practices in performing these types of analyses, but unfortunately, it's a practice that's frequently done improperly. That's the importance weight. We answer the question, how important is measure A versus measure B? Commonly used, but it's the wrong approach. What we really want to do, uh, and, and while it's, con it's tempting to only consider the importance of the objectives when assigning the weights, uh, what we have to do is what are known as swing weights. They have two components. Not only do we consider the importance of the value measure, but we also have to consider how big a gap is there between what we define as the top and the bottom of the value scale that we're using. It produces much, much more accurate results. And um, give you an example. Um, let's say you're willing to spend money to improve the braking and the acceleration performance of your car. If I asked you what's more important, the brakes or the accelerator, what would you tell me? Well, the truth is it's a silly question. You obviously need both. It doesn't make sense to ask which is more important. Yet that's how most people compare the importance of things. But what if I change the question a bit? Let's say you can improve the acceleration going from 0 to 60 by 20%. Or you can improve the braking and going from 60 to 0 by 10%. Which is a more important improvement to make? Where is this swing more significant? That's an easier and more meaningful question to answer, and it really does make sense. 
Um, in the course, we teach the students several techniques for weighting the value measures, uh, one of which is what we call the swing weight matrix, which uh, Greg Parnell developed, where we actually take the swing weight and, bre swing weight and break it up into its two components and uh, lay out explicitly for decision makers to see. Today, I'm just going to take a very simple and easy approach for weighting. Assume you have 100 coins to assign to the value measures. All you have to do is allocate them based on the relative importance of the swing weight, not the importance weight. Something that gets 40 coins is twice as significant to improve as something that gets 20 coins. Divvy up your coins, and now you have weighted your objectives and your value measures. And here's the example as applied to uh, Mike and Maddie's example. Notice the coins all add up to 100. The average same chain staff turnover rate is twice as important as the initial capital contributions in terms of their swings, because one is a 20, one is a 10. And uh, again, this is a subset of uh, the actual problem, but uh, for the ones we have here, they sum to 100. So now what I can do is I can take those, apply them to that same matrix we looked like before, and now what we do, instead of just adding across a row, we use a weighted average. So we would take 29% times 80, plus 7% times 0, plus 20% times 100, and so forth across this first row for the four-year health option. Now we get a score of 75. We do the same thing for the other options. And you can see we get the scores. One important thing to notice. Previously, when we didn't weight the value measures, fitness focus was the highest scoring alternative. But now that we've done it the right way and weighted the value measures, fit to be tied is the best alternative. The message here is that if we do things improperly, we may not get the right decision. So we now have an evaluation of our choices that includes value scales, uncertainties, and swaps across objectives. So the uh, next step and the final one that we're going to talk about today is solutions. Uh, you need to develop a plan to implement your decisions and your solutions. All too often, we stop at the analytical solution, but we must also think about how we're going to implement the solution. And the interesting thing is that we must start to do this way back in the framing step of the process. You don't want to wait till you're done to start thinking about implementation. We need to be thinking about it every step of the way through the process. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, don't have enough time to cover the last two steps in folks' process today, the elicitation of data and dissemination, so we'll leave those for another webinar down the road. Well, that's all we have time for today, so here's where we are. We're on our way to becoming focused decision makers. You know how to use some basic tools such as the stakeholder issue identification matrix, the strategy table, value hierarchy, swing weights. You know how to at least think about the probabilities associated with your decision. And you know how to compare alternatives in a way that will help you discover the best choice. When you think about it, the focused decision-making approach is all very logical and pretty easy to do. It can be used on virtually any type of problem that a decision-maker faces. It's appropriate if you're trying to decide which house to buy, which type of insurance policies to have, whether to purchase an investment property to flip, or whether or not to have surgery versus treating a condition medically. I use the general thought process on virtually every major decision I make, even if I don't develop a complete model as we did here. Just thinking about the problem in focused terms is a huge help. Um, I hope you enjoyed the taste of focused decision making, that you're excited about using the approach on your own decisions. Uh, if you wanted to read the book, it's available on Amazon in either uh, e-format or uh, as a soft cover. And uh, I now uh, open the floor to questions. And the way we're going to do questions is if you will uh, type your question in the chat box, uh, one of us will read it to uh, Terry and uh, get the answer for you. And Mindy, while we're waiting for questions um, through the chat, would you like to go over the um, program details? Absolutely. So I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, we just want to give you a little bit of information about some of the flexible online degree programs that we offer. So in the College of Engineering, uh, you can get an online master's degree in engineering. 
in engineering management or in operations management. So I work primarily with the operations management degree, um, and currently you see some information about all three degrees. Um, the operations management degree, if I can go to the next slide, um, just kind of gives you some information here. It's very affordable. You can start the program, you know, five different times per year. So here's some information about that program, and then just to let you know that we also offer a graduate certificate in project management that is only four classes. All of the classes that you take for the certificate can also count toward um, the operations management degree. So if you're interested in any of those, you all have my contact information, and I'd be happy to talk with you about those. And it looks like we might have a question. We sure do. Uh, Deborah wants to see slide 69 again. So Deborah, I'm navigating back there. Uh, the topic's not covered today. I believe that's 69. Uh, Greg says, oh, Peter says, what was the book Terry was referring to? Uh, Terry, you want to oh, talk a little bit about your book? Sure. It's called The Focus Decision Maker. Uh, <laughs> I'm the author, Terry Bresnick and Omar Piriu. Uh, uh, Omar has talked about in the uh, discussion, P-E-R-I-U. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, available as an e-book or as a soft cover book on Amazon. And uh, I think it's like nine dollars and ninety nine cents for the ebook and nineteen ninety nine for the uh, the soft cover, uh, but it covers all the concepts that we talked about here, and uh, we had a lot of fun writing it, and um, uh, I think a lot of fun reading it. Uh, let's see, how does this approach apply to groups? Uh, interesting, you talk about that. One of the things that uh, is my specialty is facilitating groups in decision making. Greg Parnell as well. We have uh, I personally have facilitated over fifteen hundred group decision making sessions. We use all these tools as a group. And where you really get into the group aspect is how you do the scoring. That's the biggest aspect where things differ. Um, for example, uh, one of the projects I worked on for many, many years was the entire Marine Corps budget. How do they do the budget analysis? So what we would do is we would use a group to go through this process of scoring and evaluating the alternatives. Uh, typically, we would first ask everybody to give individual scores using some sort of spreadsheet. We would show the spreadsheet so everybody could see how everybody else scored things. We'd have open discussion, communication, then we'd revote again to see if we can convince each other of the merits of our arguments. And then um, ultimately, we try to avoid taking averages right at the start, because then you wind up with something that nobody is saying. So the real answer to groups is informed consensus. Uh, open discussion leading to informed consensus. Oh, she wants slide 68, OK. I, I put it back there at 68, I think. Oh, oh OK. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then earlier, I don't know if Joseph is still on, but he wanted to see the slide outlining the steps. There we go. Great. I see one of the participants is Greg Binder. I uh, wonder if he's related to uh, a classmate I had named Greg Binder from West Point. That's you. Oh, OK. How you doing, Greg? If anybody has any questions about any of this, they can reach me uh, either by my email, which is t. Bresnick, T-B-R-E-S-N-I-C, at uark.edu, or they can call me at 561-994-3171, and um, I'm in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. I see Peter Beck is on the line as well. Peter is another one uh, of my colleagues who does a lot of group decision making and uh, very adept at decision analysis and focused decision making. And Terry, did I get that right? It's Bresnick without the K on the end for without the your K, email. Right. T-B-R-E-S-N-I-C at uark.edu 561-994-3171. Yeah, there it is. It's posted. Great. Great. This is fun stuff. Uh, I really enjoy doing this. I know Greg and I have worked together for many, many years doing this along with Peter. Um, 
people really need help doing this, and it's really interesting trying to take these fairly sophisticated techniques and bring it down to the level of the average decision maker. Uh, I got myself in deep trouble trying to use these techniques to help my wife figure out the most efficient way to do washes and laundry and things like that. Somehow what other people will accept as uh, my good advice, uh, people in the family don't want to hear. Thank you all for attending and for sticking with us through our technical difficulties. We hope you enjoyed the session. And thank you, Terry, for presenting. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoy doing this stuff, as you can tell. Thanks a lot. Thank I'll you, Terry. All right. Bye. Bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and Merry Christmas.